Creation as Illusion In a world of modern science, the idea that creation could be seen as simply an illusion seems humorously inappropriate. How can one maintain that the world in which we live is simply an illusion that bears no verifiable relation to anything real that underlies it? This way of understanding creation has both ancient and modern forms. In pre-Socratic philosophy, there were two major schools of thought about the world. The first view was associated with a thinker named Heraclitus. His view was that absolutely everything was in a state of flux. Everything was always changing. If this is true, then the stability that we think we see in the world around us must be an illusion, because nothing, according to this view, is finally stable. Opposite to this are the views of another philosopher, Parmenides. Parmenides lived just after Heraclitus and held that everything is one. That is, there is not finally any differentiation or change, even change in location. Any change or any differentiation between people, places, and things that we think we observe is held to be an illusion. What is interesting about both of these views is that they assert that what actually is or exists is of a different character, of a certain character. Experience, however, clearly does not support either extreme in its totality. The philosophy is left with nothing else to say but that experience is wrong. Many ancient thinkers wrote about the untrustworthiness of human experience. Neither of these philosophers were trying to undermine our ability to know the truth. Indeed, they were hoping to do quite the opposite, to affirm that, what we act, that we actually can know the truth, even when our experience makes it harder to do so. Both are trying to get down to the very most basic concept of what really exists. What is more basic, being, Parmenides, or becoming, Heraclitus? We see both of them, but they can't both be equally basic, or so it is presupposed. Therefore, it's concluded that either change or stasis must be more basic to existence, and the other must be interpreted accordingly. But what has this done? It has established a sharp epistemological dualism, as discussed in Chapter 3. Reality and our experience of reality have been utterly separated, have been declared to be incompatible. We say to Heraclitus that we experience some things as stable, and to Parmenides that we experience change. Both have no option but to say that our experience is wrong. It's clear that our experience is sometimes flawed and misinterpreted, but it is necessary. But is it necessarily the case that our experience is always so flawed as to bear no relation whatsoever to reality as it actually is? Again, neither thinker made skepticism the core of their system, but if we push their views to their logical conclusions, we must see that this is where they end up. This idea that reality is nothing more than an illusion has gained a new lease on life with the rise of postmodernity. The realization that the communities in which we inhabit play a role in what we know has also tended to cast doubt that our experience is commensurate with reality. This time, it is not because we've decided ahead of time that the world is one way while our experience is another. Instead, it is under the guise of humility saying, I only know what is in my experience, which is shaped by my environment and community. How can I know that this experience is universally valid? Even if there is an objective reality, I only ever experience it in a subjective way. I say that this argument is under the guise of humility because it is actually not very humble at all. It not only says that the, their experience might be wrong, it also asserts that the experience of everyone else can have no more claim to objectivity. In fact, if those other views presume to have an insight into how reality actually is, and not just as it sees to that, seems to them, they are dismissed as paternalistic and arrogant. And yet, how can this condemnation be made? The only way that one can state so clearly and authoritatively that no one group has access to universal truth is to implicitly claim that the statement, all experience and knowledge is relative, bears universal authority. But according to this view, how can we know this to be the case? Is not such a statement just as called into question by our limited experience as any other, and would that not open the door um, to a possibility of actual knowledge? Pluralism is often practiced in the Western world as, as is often not true pluralism. Instead, it is a dogmatic pluralism, a pluralism that marginalizes every claim to absolute authority except its own assertion of relativism. Relativism is true, at least if intended as an absolute claim, which it surely is, is a self-contradiction. The point is that, for both of these ancient and modern views, our world of experience does not bear any relationship with objective reality, if there is such a thing. Both make the leap from the reasonable admission that our experience is not always reliable to the conclusion that our experience is, by definition, untrustworthy. The question that needs to be raised is, granted that our experience cannot always be trusted, and so there's not a necessary relationship between our experience and reality, is there not a possible relationship between them? 
If the position taken by this work is that of critical realism, specifically influenced by theologian Thomas F. Torrance and philosophers of science Roy Baskar and Michael Polanyi, a view that considers creation as an illusion will take a decidedly non-realist approach.